Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, joined here on set with attorney Jessica Ramirez. And you know what we do here. We break down the biggest live trials and legal stories in the news today. A lot to cover today. So let's get started. All right, let's talk about that car. And Jessica, I'm curious, how much do you weight do you put on the car? Because as we heard, and it gets a little complicated, you have Boyd's cousin who said in previous trials she lent him this white Pontiac. Then in this trial, she said she couldn't remember. Then you have this guy named Xavier Jenkins who says he saw this white car outside the crime scene. You have George Thomas, his co-defendant, who said Boyd showed up with driving this white car. It's a way to link Boyd to the crime scene. Do you believe it? Well, I think that the car, it's, it's interesting that he was saying, you know, we're going to present direct evidence, we're going to present circumstantial evidence, and the um, circumstantial evidence was this car. And I think it doesn't prove that Mr. Boyd was uh, guilty of this crime. We know from four other or five other trials that the, he lent the car. The car was used. It was used by one of the defendants. So the fact that the car was there, to me, does not point to Boyd's um, uh, that he was guilty or to his involvement, except that he loaned the car. And I think that's been proven in various uh, other trials and in this trial. I just don't think you can pin it to Boyd. What about the bullets in the car? Again, um, we know that the, these men had guns as well, and we know that they were driving the car. We know that they had possession of the car. This was the car that the defendants were driving who were convicted uh, already. So I just don't think how it ties to Boyd, except that, yes, he lent, he lent that car. He's been in prison now for many years for helping. Well, he, yeah, he's been found guilty of accessory after the fact, but couldn't under a legal theory, if he's there and he's a witness to what's happening to these two young people and he helps facilitate it, maybe he never uh, shot anybody, maybe he never raped anybody, maybe he never participated in it, but he was there. Can he be grouped into the murder, the rape, and the kidnapping charges? Yes, if they're able to prove that he was there. Um, but if we're just speaking about this car and what does this car point to his guiltiness or whether he was really there, we don't. I, I don't think that they've done a good job as right. of yet, except that we know he loaned the car. Well, I want to play a little bit more of Phil Morton when the prosecutor here delivered this closing argument, trying to sum up this case. And a little bit later, we're going to show you the defense's response. And what a response it was, but let's continue more with how important is George Thomas to the prosecution's case? In other words, if the jury, they have to believe him in order to convict Boyd, right? Well, it's very important to this prosecutor, and I think he's making a big mistake. I think that uh, Mr. Thomas is the weakest link. Um, I think that he is a murderer. He is, a, an, I mean, what he did and what he witnessed, he was, um, this was savagery, it really was. I mean, when we talk about this room that was this apartment that was 800 square feet and he was there, um, he admits to this. Um, how can you even trust him? How can you trust a man who's exhausted his appeal process? I mean, this is his last saving grace. So I think um, they're putting a little bit too much weight on Mr. Thomas. I wouldn't believe anything he says. Um, what he did was um, savagery and, and, and he again, he's exhausted his appeals process. Here's the weird part. The state called him as their own witness. This is the same state that convicted him and, and got a jury to convince to convict him and say he was a direct participant in what happened to these two people. So their witness comes on the stand and basically denies involvement and says that he was wrongly accused. So how is the state going to say you should believe this man who is clearly going against what we did earlier. That's the part that I don't understand. How can they expect him to be mm -hmm. a credible witness? Because wouldn't it have been better if he got on the stand and says, I did all this, I was, I'm ashamed of everything I did, I'm sorry for everything I did, I was convicted, mm -hmm. I accept responsibility, but I want the world to know who else was responsible. That didn't happen. Absolutely, because he is I think he's insane. We cannot, I mean, the fact that he was even used, I don't understand what the prosecution was thinking about, except that this case is a very, um, you know, there's a lot of racial tensions, the family, and rightfully so, because these cases, when the injuries are, and, and the death, and what happens, it's so right. horrific and so brutal. This poor family really believes that boy did it. Yeah. And they really, I mean, they're just looking back at the history, they tried to, um, to speak speak to one of the, to Mr. Lactavius, I believe his name, and he, I mean, admits to having oral sex with their, with one of the victims, and they were trying to get in bed with him, to get him to admit that Boyd was 
part of part of the, uh, the the group that did this, and and still he wouldn't do it. So I think that this family, the racial tensions, what's going on, has a lot to do with this. Well, look, they think this is the last person that they can get right here, and we'll talk more about the plea, the deal that Thomas took. But what did you say to me before? You want to see what the defense did? When we come back, we're going to play you the defense's closing argument, their response to what you just heard. Stay tuned. Okay, what's important for a defense attorney to do here during their closing argument? They think the state has a very weak case. How do you want to present it to the jury without becoming coming off uh, as an, you know in the wrong light or coming out as a little uh, cocky in a way or a little bit too pushy or condescending? What is the trick there? Well, you never want to be cocky or pushy. You want to tell a story. You want to make your client look like a, um, a, a real person. A lot of times, juries forget that um, defendants are not real people. So you want, and then you want to poke holes and pull coals and uh, raise reasonable doubt. And I think that uh, what he said is that there, it's completely um, true. There is no uh, forensic evidence. There is uh, direct evidence, and the prosecutor keeps pointing to this direct evidence, but the direct evidence is testimony from, a, um, from Mr. Thomas. And direct em ev evidence is usually done by testimony based on somebody's knowledge and observation. But the jury has to believe that observation and that person's knowledge of the observation and believe them. Um, and just using that alone, I think they're going to have a really difficult time to just take Mr. Thomas's uh, testimony by itself. So I think that what they're doing is um, they're poking holes. And yes, and basically, you have to have some common sense because, again, we're the, the jury, it's a jury of our peers. And a lot of it um, is common sense. They're not uh, legal experts. So present the facts and do it in a common sense storytelling way. Well, let's see if Clinton Frazier took your advice and mm -hmm. as he continued on with his closing arguments, trying to poke holes in the prosecution's case, as Jessica said, really questioning the testimony of Thomas, who is the state's star witness. And we're gonna break that down a little bit more. Let's play more of Clinton Frazier's uh, closing argument from yesterday. When you talk about George Thomas's testimony, is it a bit questionable, the deal that he was given? Uh, is it questionable that all these years later, he, we now have him testifying against Boyd? And there was this issue of that, he, yes, he came forward in the beginning and pointed the finger at Boyd, but it couldn't be used, and now it can be used. So I guess the question is, is the deal strike you as strange that maybe it's not credible, that he's just saying whatever he needs to say to reduce his prison sentence? Because let's not forget, he had two consecutive life sentences, and in exchange for testifying, now he only has to serve f uh, 50 years and really only a, a certain percentage of that, so he could technically get out in 42 and a half years. What do you think? Absolutely. I am so upset about Mr. Thomas. I think that 1,000% he is getting a great deal for his testimony. Again, we have to remember that he's exhausted his all his appeal process. We have to remember what he was charged with. He was in another room of an apartment. It was 800 square feet where a woman was being tortured, raped. Uh, but by he didn't hear or different... see anything. He didn't hear or sure, see anything. Sure, right. Because um, when you are in an apartment that's 800 square feet, you don't do that. So I, I think that uh, again, I, they, they're really, the state is really rolling the dice with this guy, and 1,000% he is lying, and he can't be trusted. Absolutely not. But can't this backfire? So if you're the family of the victims and you want justice for um, you know, your children, your loved ones, the question is, let's, they just gave this guy a great deal. Let's say they don't, the prosecution can't secure a guilty verdict against Boyd. Doesn't the, don't the victims, family members, they lose out in this? Absolutely, they're going to lose out. And it's so terrible because they, in their hearts, they really believe Mr. Boyd was a part of it. And they really believe that um, he's going to be get let off uh, scot-free after 18 years when he should be in prison. So it's really sad um, because these, par these families, I mean, this is so horrible that this happened to them. Uh, but usually, I would be surprised that uh, the deal is already in writing. Usually, uh, what the state does, they um, you have to first testify, and then you get your deal. Because he could right. testify, and or the last minute, he could say, I'm not going to do it anymore, or get on the stand and say, uh, Mr. Boyd had nothing to do with it. So I don't think that uh, the deal is already put in writing and set through. They're going to wait for him to testify, see what he says. And then um, they would have to adhere to any deals that they yeah, need. Yeah, it's not contingent on them mm -hmm. securing a guilty verdict, but as long as he testified the way they wanted him to testify, mm -hmm. and by all accounts he did that, 
he's uh, going to get a reduced sentence. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to switch gears and talk about the big development in the Grant Amato trial. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.